But this time on the show, it's important that we have broader perspectives as we're joined by Honorable Cletus Obun. Good morning to you, sir. Thanks for having me once again to advocate for our country and for the betterment of Nigeria where no man is oppressed. Now, let's start very quickly from the People's Parliament, because the People's Parliament, especially the upper chambers, has been a subject of speculations, debates, away from the motions they move, of course, but debates on party affiliations and the position of senators as it concerns the leadership of the president of the Senate. We've seen widespread refutals of a purported wrangling among some senators to impeach the president of the Senate. It's coming at a time when he has also spoken about the use of AI to manipulate statements he has made. What's your position on the current affairs of the 10th Assembly under the leadership of the President of the Senate, Senator Gosu Lakpabio, amidst all these speculations? Well, let me first say that Nigerians must not get too excited to throw away what they have acquired. Only those who have not experienced war will think that the sound of bullets and gunshots is the music and staccato of a reggae dance hall. There is no way anybody who has seen us here between the early 1970, between 1979, 83, 93, and to 99 will ever wish that we have that type of disruptive democracy. We've gone unbroken for the 25th year and still counting and those blessings we are not appreciating. And when some people speak the way they speak, disrupting the parliament. Parliament is the umbilical cord that fits democracy. Take it away and there is no democracy. The lubricating factor is the kind of exchanges that you find. And that is to say that if you do not find it, we are trying to stabilize ourselves. And in doing so, some people take it to the extreme. It is not bad enough. It is not bad at all for there to be discussions going on, to be agitations, to, to make demands, to have tendencies that are on one side or the other. The Americans have, we call the, Repub the Republicans, and they have their Democrats. Their policies are welfareist, and the others are free enterprise, which is the cardinal objectives, which took them over 200 years to stabilize. Don't forget that this America came to a point where a woman cannot vote, a black cannot vote or go to certain places. People forget that part of their history. They were as primitive as that. And people were being killed. People were humiliated. People were punished for crossing the boundaries between black and white, between man and woman. Americans passed through that. But we are lucky enough to just come and start with the issue of I'm APC, you are PDP, you are MPN, you are Action Congress, you are Action Group, you are... Northern Nigerian People's Congress. All that came to pass, and in our own case, we call it tribalism. At other times, we call it religious tendencies. But the Americans and all the democracies we are copying from went through those tendencies by different nomenclatures. So what is happening to our own present uh, parliament? Because that is where you have the plurality of opinion. Diversity of opinion is what defines democracy. So if the parliament is satisfied or not satisfied with their leadership, what you have in parliament, nobody was brought into parliament to become a leader of senate. You were brought there first as a senator. So from among the equals, you find your best. Or the, the people you feel, the person you feel can lead you at a particular time. Under Akpabio leadership in the 10th senate, Senator Akpabio has demonstrated the sagacity of a leader. But what most people don't understand him is that his amiable nature sometimes is misinterpreted. The most misinterpreted senate president ever. Not controversial, most misinterpreted. The controversial ones were people like the year for year, Chuba Kadibo. You had those controversial senior presidents. But of course, you remember also that under Abbas and in eight years, five senior presidents emerged. But we are gradually we are stabilizing it, in which you find them, uh, 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 um, uh, what do you call him, the uh, David Mark, come to sit for that period without any disruptions. And you could see the progress we made under that leadership. And then, of course, we came down to the point. Of course, if you remember, it was a, a doctrine of resistance that brought about a situation where the president of the Senate and the president of the country were from the two sides of the country. In order to stabilize our democracy, I think that the first stabilizing rod, the stabilizing point, should be the parliament. And I think the parliamentarians have come out clearly to say 
that it is never the intention, it was never any plan, and so they even go into ethnic divisions to say it is a modern caucus. And uh, I'm happy one of the senators, I think Senator Mingi, came out to say that his, his integrity was impugned upon when it was imputed, being a modern senator, that modern caucus is planning to do, that there is no such meeting, there is no such plan, and there is no such thing, that the present situation is clearly stabilizing, and that the entire Senate is under the wraps and in tune with the Senate President, Senator Aquabio's leadership. And they have demonstrated that by coming out with the vote of confidence. I don't think there's any further discussion or any further proof of the fact that the Senate is one across party lines. There have been no divisions. I have been to the floor of the Senate. I support the Senate President as an assistant on strategic communication. And I can assure you that the Senate President and his colleagues across party lines, across ethnic divides, have demonstrated, across religious divides, most of his closest allies are Muslims, and he's a strong, staunch Catholic. Now, now, in terms of this communication and misunderstanding, one of the comments that I picked up from some of our viewers were the fact that they said he made light-hearted comments about serious issues, and for you who have worked closely with him, and just like you said on the program, he has more of a, a subtle approach towards using some jokes to douse quite... Uh, volatile situations but does this mean that he is not taking it as serious as many nigerians feel the issue should be taken it is not the duty of a leader to bring and inflict pain upon his people he must laugh with them when they are laughing and cry with them when they are crying when they took that out of context situation in which he was saying wherever you see food eat it it was the very bloggers who brought and engaged in that level of AI and distortion and disinformation that went back to play the full video, in which he was addressing their colleagues, in which in their first day they were to go for a dinner. And he was preparing their mind for the dinner. And said, times are hard, gentlemen, so go there, don't select the kind of food you eat. If you are eating macaroni and you see corn, eat it. He now took it, and they just went to that click and took, that it out of and took it out of context. And those who watched it are still singing it yesterday. I was coming from Calabar, at the airport, the third man who took me, and a, a graduate clearly, was telling me that this problem is a problem that how can he say that anywhere you see food, you should eat it. Does it mean we should eat from the dustbin? He did not still go back to watch the full video to know that he was referring to his colleagues. And it has been played out. Um, channels and your sister stations, most of your stations have come out with a full video. They got back to do a fact check, which is what most people don't do. So some people have made it a point of duty. They are calling to ensure that Aquabio is misquoted and must trend negatively at every time. We don't blame them. In fact, they make us stronger as a nation. It only makes us to be more alert because equity does not avail the indolent. And so it puts us on the toe and puts us on the toe, but it is distracting. Because you should be focusing on what Nigerians should get and what Nigerians should. For a man who has been governor, you cannot ask him and say that he is he's a puerile, uh, a brainless person. Some people will go to the extent to say that a lawyer of more than 30 years, a governor of eight years, a commissioner, a minister is brainless. When you get to that level of desperation and the de disparaging of leadership, it does not show criticism, that's cynicism. And when you get to that level of cynicism, you are getting yourself into the gutters of intellectual activity. And now, he himself has said to forget about the distractors. And in the most recent plenary session, he cried with the people to borrow from your words. Following the explosion in Jigawa, where over 100 persons sadly passed away while scooping fuel. Now, we saw the minute silence as observed in the hollow chambers, but beyond which has become a recurrent explosion here in Durumi. It was a, a cooking gas cylinder that exploded in a door cng illegally modified vehicle that exploded this explosion is coming at a time when there is a high cost of living the senate is now mandating committees to look into these different issues but holistically what can the national orientation agency do in line with this call from the 10th senate to forestall these sad occurrences we keep on seeing precisely uh, where I will always call Senator Akwabio, he's so proactive and shows that he's always with the people. Because it is only a person who is not sitting on the high horse and includes in a castle that comes out to the streets to see what we are discussing now, including the president of Nigeria, who I know Senator Akwabio sometimes carry his own car with only his driver and goes around this town 
just like the president does. And that is why responses to national issues are as effective as we saw in the floods in Jigawa, I mean in uh, Meduguri, as you saw in the floods across the country and the alerts that are going on, so that even in critical places where government should be discussing policy and high dry theories of economic uh, uh, revi uh, revivalism, they come back to talk, the street talk about how to get away from danger. And it becomes a talk of the high and the low. So in this particular context, what we are dealing with is the invention of a new technology that has not been, that people are not familiar with. Nobody saw that people are pouring kerosene into water because they now know that this is what kerosene is. So techno the technology like gas and petrol and other such things is new to the people. Gas has become so commonplace because kerosene is no longer aff affordable. Firewood is no longer affordable. Uh, it's not even available because of the desiccation of the def deforestation if it's really going on. So what we are now resorting to is gas, which Nigeria is now bringing into the market. So it needs heavy orientation on re native radio stations, on flyers in churches and mosques, to opinion leaders, traditional rulers. They must be given this so that it becomes an orientation every morning, just like the town crier goes round. As you are going away, please remember to put off your gas. Remember to put off your light. It should be announced on radio, a national orientation agency, and other information units of the NNPC and other such places should take radio slots and be doing that every morning. Have you put off your gas? It should be a jingle that must ring. Remember to put off your gas. It should be there every morning and every evening. As you are going to bed, have you put off your gas? People must be reminded on that until they get used to it. That must go on for the next four years. On every morning and every evening, National Radio must do that. You're going to walk, yeah, have you put off your gas? Remember to put off your gas. Remember to put off, that should be there. It looks as it is too much, but you're going to find that. Then there should be big samples on the road because you're going to soon have keke napeps that are using Sweet. gas and then uh, the, the, the vehicles are using. So big samples, uh, put off your gas, manage your gas well, manage your gas well. It should be there in all bus stops, in all offices. But, in but, car parks. But what, what does this speak about the safety culture of Nigerians? Because for CNG, like you said, this enhanced sensitization is needed. But for Phil, where many Nigerians have been privy to sad occurrences, whenever a trailer laden with petroleum products falls over, we still see Nigerians rush to the scene to scoop fuel. What does this say about our safety culture as a people? It's not safety culture. It is our survival culture. Now people are pretending. It is not the first time, even when we were not here now, about 10 years ago, over the years, each time a tanker falls, in fact, we have almost lost our humanity. So our survival instincts have overtaken our humanity. Before now, you find people telling you that if you see a stranger and do any evil to him, you are planting evil for your generation. That kind of culture no longer exists. It is about how do I survive now? What's my business? So a man has a car crash, is bleeding. Somebody is videoing to send on his blog to make money rather than go to save the person. A man is having to steal or jumping. Rather than go and save the man, they are videoing him how he is about to jump and die. Somebody is hoping a, a child is being maltreated almost to the point of death. Somebody stands there videoing it to show how wicked the woman is. So if patrol tanker, rather than tell everybody, don't come near, don't come near. Everybody's rather rushing there. It is good luck for them. It's good luck. God has blessed them that this well is free. And they get involved in it. Is it a jibo you are going to talk about? Did it happen in twenty did it happen in twenty twenty four? A jibo? Uh, uh, um, Oshodi, was it in 2024? This was sometime in 2001. As far back as then, fuel gets down and people are rushing there to go and scoop rather than run away from it, knowing that it is dangerous. Now, I hope that what has happened in Jigawa, that many more are going to learn. What has happened in Ibadan, I hope many more will learn that this is danger and not food. This is a bit to death. Now, now, now let's take it a step further whilst this call and advocacy has come at the right time many are also asking the alternative roads for transportation can we have the rail lines 
take up the heavy burden of lifting some of these petroleum products other than putting them on the Nigerian roads that are quite in a deplorable state at this moment? I just came from Oguja to Calabar. And from Calabar, I flew to Abuja. I, had, I have no car here. Yeah. And what that means is that the roads are made dead traps by the... Because in building those roads, nobody anticipated the volume of traffic, the volume of cars. If you check the average cars that come per minute and per day on those roads, was never anticipated during the construction of those roads 20, 25 years, 30 years ago. Because those roads were not built in 1999. So those roads were built in 1980. The Calabar Ecom Casinala Road was built in 1979, 1980, 81. Completed in 1981. The road from Ecom to the ranch was built in 1982. Was completed in 1982. So you discover that first the lifespan of those roads have expired because they are supposed to, within a particular period, be again rehabilitated. That has not taken place. And today, you discover that you come to Ormepan, to Obudu, nobody passes there anymore. You have to go through Ogoja to go to Obudu. So these are one than nine kilometers. You are now needing 182 kilometers to get to Obudu from Ikom today, as we speak. Even at that, the Bekwara end of it is now locked down. So you have to go through villages and villages to come out on other portions of the road. So it happens to you that you have to come out through Upa to come out to Uburu. You have to come out through Boki, through Ethereum, down to Kakwagom to Konde, for you to come out of Depot Greener Junction to return to Ikom. That is what happens to you if you are going. But that's a distance of 45 minutes. It's two and a half hours now for you to come out of those areas to start your journey to come. So rather than use 45 minutes from Ikom to Goja, you are now using two and a half hours today as we speak. And these are federal roads, not state roads, federal roads. So we are asking the Minister of Works, Weather and FEMA, the intervention agency, of for roads and infrastructure. Is Crossover still part of Nigeria? If it is, can we especially? Between the 60 kilometers from Ahom to Calabar, the Buari administration did that road and stopped 60 kilometers, 205 kilometers. 60 kilometers of it are left from Ahom to Calabar. Ahom to Calabar, 60 kilometers now, is two hours. 60 kilometers now to get to Calabar is two hours. What will tell you if a truck falls there, you remain there. You are going to know the same thing. So why is Crossover State hemmed in? Hand in on all sides. We can't get out to Aquibom. We can't come out to, to Benway. We're shut down. Cross river economy is going down. We have the largest timber ever on West African coast. We have the largest banana and pineapple ever on the West African coast. Only out the coast compete with the Boki pineapple. We, have, we share the boundary with Cameroon on the eastern, western flank. Right from Akangpa down to through a tomb to Boki, to Obudu Cattle Ranch, all that area. We have the ranch resort, the highest ever uh, belt that you have in Nigeria, apart from Gembo. So why is, are these resources being undermined? Now, talking about the lack of in-depth harnessing of these vast potentials in Cross River, particularly in Ogoja, would it come as a relief to you that a bill in the House of Representatives has passed second reading for the creation of a new state in the South-South region, particularly the Ogoja state. Does it come as a relief for you? It will be the biggest thing that gift that the Tinubu administration will give to us and it will remind us of what Awo and Zeke had advocated all before they died. I met them and as a young journalist, we were able to get them a start to the fact that what they are looking for is Ijebu and Ogoja state. The Ogoja state has no better time than now because like my governor will say, the present governor of Cross River State will say, it will relieve him from traveling for seven hours and giving this vast land. We will not need a visa from Calabar to Goja. Half of what you have as Calabar today is populated by the people you know as Goja people. And honorable, please be, so we need it. be specific because of the 18 local government areas in Cross River State. How many of these local governments would constitute the Goja State? Would you also tap into other states like Benue with 
Vandicha local government also bordering Cross River. What would be your ideal landscape for the new Oguja state? Oguja state, for your information, is comprised of the present 11 local government. Abi. So that would mean taking 11 out of the 18 from Cross River? From Cross River. And yet, I know that some of those places you are calling local government, like Yako, like Buki, like Yala, Obudura, constitute states of their own in terms of landmass. In terms of landmass, three of those local governments equal to Bayasa and Rivers put together as landmass. Two, three of those local governments, Yala, Boki, and Yako, put together are more than the landmass of Rivers and Bayasa put together. Yet, the 11 local governments have been yoked into Calabar. When in 1963, there was a demand for core states, that is Calabar Ogoja Rivers. Calabar then was the present Akwaibom. Ogoja was then the present Ebony and Ogoja. And when they created, they created rivers, and from rivers they've created Bayelsa. They created Calabar. Calabar from there has created Akwaibom. Ogoja is still left with part of Calabar. This is the greatest injustice you can find. There can never be equality. This is not the mantra of our national anthem, which says that we shall have a land where no man is oppressed. And Nigeria will be blessed. Nigeria cannot be blessed on the state of equity, inequity, inequality, and in which development is now compartmentalized. And the people of Ogoja province today, I, I said to you that Afipo and Abakilike, we are divisions which you call local government today under Ogoja province. Today, Abakilike, a local government under Ogoja province, is a third capital. And Ogoja is still languishing as one of the third rate suburbans in Nigeria by any standard in terms of infrastructure. Ogoja itself, not to talk about places, commercial centers like Ecom, the potentials are simply abound. You cannot just, the economic potentials of that area, I've told you, between Ogubra, Yako. Let, let's single out Yako. And for Yako in terms of the Yako festival, Leboku, over time has attracted foreign visitors into Nigeria and people often think it happens in the capital city, Calabar. Why do you think that despite this international acclaim, it has failed to take its pride of place as one of the standout festivals in Nigeria? Because the journey to come to this point that you even recognized started late. We took it as part of our tradition and culture, never knew the economic benefits of getting it into the state of a carnival and a festival of international repute. Now that it has, you can see in leaps and bounds, it is becoming more and more. You have that in, among the Bakos, among the Bokis. The entire Buddha program have their New Year festivals on a daily basis up until September. Beginning from August, Boki being the first on the 18th of August every year, you are having the Boki Festival. That too has not been celebrated. That was the first ever in the entire Abuja province. Then Yako, which we call Liboku. Then, of course, the Bakor people beginning who stretch from it come to Abuja itself and all those people. Then they come themselves and all that. So you find all the, then the Ukele people, the Yala people, have their New Year festivals in September. So Obudu and Obaniku have their New Year festivals. All the entire, what I'm calling them, we are divisions. Ecom division, Obubra division, uh, Oboja division, Obudu division. Those are the four divisions that have the 11 local governments we are talking about now. Akangpa and Calabar, Odupani, I left with Calabar. While Uyo, Ikorepene, another 18 and Eket, I left in the present Akwaibom. Those were 14 divisions in the then southeastern state which were then the provinces that made up of Calabar, Oguja, and Rivers, which were agitating to leave the mainstream heartland of the present Southeast. They were agitating that the oppression was too much and they needed to, as minorities, get their own. And that is why in 1967, Gowon created the 12 states and gave Southeastern state, combining uh, Oguja and Calabar and giving Rivers its own state. Calabar and Oguja were created as Southeastern state rather than create them separately but they put them together which is what we are suffering now which is what this bill by honorable Ofeno is one of the best things that happened to us the best gift that we can ever get and i think that president tinubu will make history and uh senior president akpabu will be doing that because being an anime man coming from the then uh, the, the, the present uh Aquabum state which was then under calabar among the wrong people being in the senate now History is about to be made, and the timing is ripe. And I think this is the best thing that God has done for us to have an acquired former Calabar person as senior president 
and a Democrat like Ashwajo Abedo, a scion of the great sage Awolowo, coming on board now to give the good people and liberate them from this very economic and political repression and oppression of having to do a distance of nine hours within the same state. Let me inform you, it is cheaper and easier for an Ogoja person, an Obudu person from the old Ogoja province to get to Abuja than to get to Calabar. Wow. Now, in terms of the implications of what this would mean, either by economic perspective or by political advantage, are also debates of rotational presidency and the creation of more regions and how it will affect the votes that will count towards that. Whilst that is on one hand, there's also the need for these local governments in these 11 local government areas to generate their own IGR and be self-sustaining. You've listed the potentials they have. But imagine this too. Are you sure that this would not further disunite or disintegrate the proposed new Ogoja state? Let me ask you. There are six states in western Nigeria today. What you call Southwest. They have their Yoruba festival in Latin America every year. The Igbos have the Igbo Congress in the U.S. every year. There are five states. Has that polarized them? It has rather united them. You have the Ariwa unit. You have Ohanese in the Igbo. What does that tell you? The stream of Ubuntu, the spirit of togetherness and brotherhood, anywhere you find your blood, you need to be out of there. As I speak, I'm having good pimples. If you travel out of this country and walk, see a black man, not a Nigerian, a black man, he said, I'm from Kenya, you already have found a brother. It's automatic. The DNA matches. The magnetic, the, the spiritual magnetism automatically is switched on. Not to talk about you finding somebody from Sokoto, you are from Benue State, and you find somebody from Oshobo, and he says, I'm from Oshobo. You first of all call him a boy. Even when you cannot speak Yoruba. And he's forced to first of all go, how are you? That's the first thing he will do. That is the kind of brotherhood we have. The false divisions we are talking about are orchestrated by for political reasons. How come Dangote did not build his refinery in Kano? It's a commercial nerve center, second only to Lagos. It is called one Nigerianness. He found it convenient. No friends there. Show me one millionaire you know in northern Nigeria. Out of every ten. Millionaires will find in northern Nigeria. Nine of them grew up in Lagos. Are they no longer Muslims? They are no longer Hausa and Fulani. But when you want to contest election, you remind us of who is a Muslim and who is a Christian. Ask Dangote his partners. They are mostly Yoruba and Igbos. They don't ever question themselves whether on the table of negotiation and signing signatures about what deals to cut out in Cuba, what deals to cut out in UK, what to do in Switzerland, or what to do in Holland, what to do in Canada or in America. Onyema is the one defending Dangote more than anybody today and insisting because he's a key player in the aviation industry. And he said that the A1 fuel should be gotten from Dangote refinery. That's an Igbo man speaking for an Hausa man, a Kofulani. Nobody remembers that in business. The only time we remember it. Is when somebody wants to be governor or president or vice president. When somebody wants to be in a senator or house or assembly member, he now remembers how his grandfather told him that these people are wicked. <laughs> now, now we have five minutes and in closing, let's talk about one of the biggest controversies that is still, haven't happened over a week ago, still very fresh on the papers. Now and it's on the current hardship in the country. The first lady in her magnanimity stood behind her husband and said, the cost of living crisis is not occasioned by her husband's policies. We've seen the opposition blowing the drums of the subsidies and everything being an orchestration of the Renew Hope mandate, which they claim is going south. In finding true perspectives of how these principles in the long term will better Nigeria's economy while taking the baby steps of pains, much like the president said, how do we find a defense for the first lady and also probably what people say is the role of opposition in every government? I have said criticism should not be for criticism's sake. What she said, even the opposition have ad admitted, just that it is coming from the wife of the president has now become an issue for debate and discussion. That level of mental idleness in which you engage in frivolities and mundane arguments that trivializes the seriousness of the Nigerian situation today, occasioned by the hardship. I thought what they would be saying to us, 
You say you are doing subsidy. Where is the money from subsidy? And the man says, read their books. The Minister of Finance is publishing to you where the money is going to. It is with your governors. I haven't gone a step ahead to see that you should go to the local government. You did not. No civil society organization, no activist went to court in spite of the freedom of information bill that Buhari, who was seen to be a narcissist, Buhari, whom they called all kinds of names, brought out the freedom of information bill and all the, made it get passed. You now have access to any information you want from government. No civil society group or activist or any group went to court to insist on autonomy for local government. Not even the labor organized labor could do that. MNPC is tormenting us today. They've done nothing about it. Their workers are there. Pengerson is there. Petroleum workers have their unions. And they are members of NLC and TUC. They've never told us why why price can't come down, why they can go to the refinery and the four refineries can't function. And people are working in MNPC and any more money than the president of Nigeria. And the president of Nigeria does not know how much fuel comes out of there and how much is going to the federation account from NNPC. Now, so, the, now, the World Bank report agrees with you. The World Bank report has published has also urged the federal government to audit the NNPC for its indebtedness and ensure that that money goes to the federal, to, to FAC. Uh, we've been getting this advice from the World Bank for some time now. Do you think that the current administration would heed to this cause to audit the NNPC? This president is a product of the oil and gas industry from its origins in Nigeria and has played at the international scene from the US to the UK to Nigeria. So he should know better what to do with the oil industry. And I think his information man managers must help him to get Nigerians to know what this president is doing about that area to reform it. He's doing so much, but so little is known about it. So information management in this government, between 2015 and today, information management has been grossly, grossly inadequate. It has been anything but effective and efficient. And I think the information managers are either dishonest, too weak, or grossly incompetent. But for whatever reason, there should be a deliberate and conscious effort to show that this government and under this president, the you know, Wutis parliamentarians, when they come, it is easy for them to say, we have a rubber stamp parliament. It is easy for them to say, the, the, the ministers are not working. But which minister is not working and how are they not working? We must demonstrate it in the media space. Now, lastly, the last question before we go, the Bauchi state governor has been the most vocal about not working. He has said these policies are not working and the people are hungry. I don't know what informed his projections because the World Bank is saying that it needs to last for the next 10 to 12 years to actually get the right effects. Listening to his comments against the World Bank projections, which would you back? I will tell you this. The building of nations is not a tonky technology. It is not automated by a magic wand. It is a process. Check from for, from uh, 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 first to, uh, uh, what do you call it? From under development to development, it's a process. It's not a destination. Not even America has agreed that it has arrived. America is still developing. Britain is still developing. Even their democracy. So ours cannot in 64 years be seen to be perfect. If we say so, then we are deceiving ourselves. So for me, what they are saying is correct that we need time to get this, but people are impatient with that because they are hungry now, and it is only living people that will see the result in 12 years' time. So for them to be alive and see that, they are palliatives all over the world, all over the world. The effect of COVID-19 is still there. Governments are intervening in different forms. So it is important that Nigerians get to understand that we are not going to get out of the woods in one year's time, in 12 months' time. But government must intervene because all countries, all nations, intervene on behalf of the countries to ameliorate the effect of certain policies that will take time to heal or to come into fruition or to come into perfection. Until that happens, Nigerian government must continue to intervene the way it is doing by using the oil subsidy money effectively and judiciously and monitoring it and supervising it. It's not enough to just throw the money to the governors and allow them to do what they like with it. It is not enough for local government to get autonomy, but supervision more be efficient and effective. Well, Honorable Clayton Zobun, I must thank you. Whenever he's in the studio, it's a no holds bar conversation. And it's quite robust in terms of the issues we cover, from the parliament to the current economic realities to projections by the World Bank. If you are interested in re-watching this conversation,
please head over to our YouTube channel at ADBN TV and you would find it. Well, I must thank you, sir, for taking our time to grace the program and wishing you the best of the week ahead. Thanks and have a very robust weekend. Congratulations for your new baby. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. Well, this is as much as we can take from our Buja studios this morning. Morning Express continues from our Uyo studios, where our sports analysts in the company of Bright James is waiting to take you on the weekend build-up following the conclusion of the international break and the resumption of elite leads across Europe and not forgetting at home here in the MPFL. I am Bito Brian wishing you the best of the weekend. Have a nice day.